January 1944, the Soviet Union launches a massive armored attack against German forces on the Eastern Front. We knew they were coming. We were told to be on the lookout for Russian tanks. The Soviets unleash wave after wave of tanks on the beleaguered Germans. On the Soviet side, 1,580 tanks in assault guns. We have to stop them because it's going to be worse if they take over Germany. Vastly outnumbered, the Germans fight desperately to hold off the Soviet attackers. This tank battalion was the only one against 2,000 Soviet tanks. This is something I never forget in my life. In some of the most vicious armored firefights of the war, Red Army and German tanks clash in the battle for the Baltics. That was a dead man's job. July, 1943. Two years of vicious fighting between the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany reaches a bloody climax, when Adolf Hitler orders his forces to make one last all-out attempt to crush the Red Army. After weeks of bitter fighting near the city of Kursk, the Germans are battered and in full retreat. The battle decided the outcome of the war. It was a turning point for the Red Army. In the fall of 1943, the Soviets prepare a massive offensive to drive the German invaders from the Russian motherland once and for all. Their plan, attack all along the Eastern Front with overwhelming numbers of men and machines. In the north, the Soviets will advance through the Baltic states and push into Germany through East Prussia. And on January 14th, 1944, the Red Army attacks. For the Baltic campaign, the Soviets field three entire army groups, composed of 1.2 million troops, thousands of heavy guns, and a staggering 1,500 tanks. The main strength of the Russian Armored Corps was always the mass. The Russians always formed waves of tanks and sent them forward as a huge group, as a blunt instrument. The mainstay of the Soviet Armored Corps is the T-34 medium tank. Weighing 30 tons and equipped with a 76 millimeter main cannon and 45 millimeters of sloping frontal armor, the T-34 provides a perfect balance of firepower, protection, and maneuverability. When the Soviet Army started the offensive, the superiority was so gigantic, the German units had no chance. The Germans had uh, to retreat to a line uh, backwards, the so-called uh, Panther Line. To defend the Panther Line, the Germans can only muster 600,000 troops, a few thousand artillery guns, and less than 200 operational tanks and assault guns. The Germans scramble to reinforce the line with all of their remaining tanks, but the rapidly advancing Red Army outflanks them. The Soviets punch through the line, creating a bridgehead 15 kilometers deep on the west bank of the Narva River. Now they threaten the flank of German Army Group North and the vital rail link that supplies it. 
Before the main attack, an advanced column of T-34s probed German lines in a sector defended by two mobile anti-tank guns. We were standing guard in, I think it was uh, in the, near Kinderheim, at that area, Alberi. We were just standing by. The artillery, of course, always shot at us from a distance. We were told, be on the lookout for Russian tanks. We knew they were coming because there were some infantry people in front of us, and they radioed back that there are noises in the woods. It sounds like tanks. Couldn't see exactly, you know, because it was still in the shadow of those trees. I didn't keep my eyes off my telescope the whole time. Then finally, I saw something moving there. And sure enough, that's where the Russians came out. And I told the commander, he just says, Feuer frei. OK, shoot. The Sturmgeschütz is a mobile tank destroyer. With its low silhouette and high velocity 75 millimeter main gun, the Stug is the deadliest anti-tank weapon in the German armory. And by 1944, they have destroyed 20,000 Red Army tanks. The first one, it hit, but it didn't do any damage. As soon as you shoot, the uh, loader, he puts a, a grenade in right away. He is ready. I knew the distance. All I had to do is uh, turn it a degree or two, you know, and shoot again. And we knocked it out. One after the other came out. They had 10 tanks. They shot, but they, they missed. It's like they didn't know what to do. This was a common saying in the German army. Don't worry about the Russians, they always miss the first shot. Our buddy next to us it was about oh, 100 yards from us, and he knocked out two. The third one, I think, started to move back already when I shot it. And the fourth one was farther back already. And, but I still hit it. And then one took off. Our buddy chased him. He knocked him out. The others, they all disappeared. We shot six down. And where they didn't hit one of us, they were too slow. We're just faster and better. I told my commander, I said, uh, I was lucky. I said that I hit them all. He said, you were not lucky. You were trained to hit them all at the first time with the first shot. Their superior gunnery skills leave the two Stugs in sole possession of the battlefield. But the victory is short-lived. Now the fighting gets even deadlier. The Germans, desperate to stop the swarming T-34s, throw their most powerful weapon into the fight, the massive 57-ton Tiger tank. January 1944. The Soviet Union launches a major offensive against Hitler's forces on the Eastern Front. In the north, they attack the Panther Line, where battle-hardened but heavily outnumbered Germans struggle to fend off the attacks. I told my commander, I was lucky, I said, that I hit them all. He said, you were not lucky, you were trained to hit them all at the first time with the first shot. After weeks of fighting, the Soviets create a small bridgehead on the German southern flank. Now they plan to push north to the Baltic Sea, encircling Hitler's army group north. But they must attack before the spring thaw turns the frozen ground to mud, slowing the tanks.
By mid-March, they have assembled a massive tank force that the Germans cannot hope to match. In 1944, on the German side, we are only uh, 16 tanks and 109 assault guns. And on the Soviet side, 1,580 tanks and assault guns. Outgunned and outnumbered, the German High Command sends in one of their best tank commanders, Lieutenant General Hyacinth Strachwitz von Großsauch. Strachwitz was known to be the Panzer General. He was the best tank general. He was a Graf, of course, a count, you know. But he was uh, very well liked and he was a smart man. Strachwitz quickly strengthens anti-tank defenses on the Panther line, but has a bigger problem, keeping the vital supply lines open. German army has not enough vehicles. A problem for the German army was also the fuel, because they had not enough fuel anymore. It should be an easy victory for the well-supplied Red Army. But Strachwitz has one big advantage, an elite panzer unit he can deploy to critical parts of the front. The most famous tank unit, perhaps, uh, on German side on our front was the heavy tank battalion number 502. The star of the 502nd is Otto Karius, who has turned it into one of the deadliest tank units in the German army. And on March 17, 1944, the 502nd scrambles to head off Red Army tanks at a vital crossroads held by German infantry. Karius and fellow tank ace Albert Kirscher arrive just as the Soviets unleash a punishing artillery barrage. The Russians shot with every available weapon. The entire sector was covered with such a barrage that we thought all hell had broken loose. Where is A sea of fire, constant shooting, constant explosions. The sound was intense to the point of blocking your hearing. The Soviet barrage lifts, and swarms of T-34s rush forward. Nothing stands between them and their objective, except Karius and Kirscher, in two of the deadliest tanks of the Second World War. The 57-ton Tiger was developed to counter the T-34. It carries a powerful 88-millimeter main gun, and with 100 millimeters of protective armor, is all but impervious to T-34 fire. Carrier sends Kirscher out into the open, directly in the gun sights of the advancing T-34s. It was clear that they were pushing north with strong forces in order to roll up our bridgehead at Narva. T-34s were already closing at full speed. One of the most decisive factors was radio. The Germans were very keen on getting every tank equipped with a radio, and therefore they were able to maneuver very flexible on the battlefield. They were able to communicate on the battlefield, and therefore they were able to toy with the Russian troops. I was able to notify Kershaw just in time. Everything happened in the blink of an eye. They careened into a bomb crater and didn't come out. As the Soviets press their attack, Karius targets tank after tank with his 88-millimeter gun. 
you always have to try to hit between the turret and the, the main body. And this is where you can do the most damage. The remaining T-34s didn't even get to fire. They probably also didn't have a clue as to who knocked them out and from where. The attack at the crossroads fails. And all across the Baltic front, the Red Army offensive bogs down in the spring thaw. The Soviets now build up a force of more than a million men for a summer offensive. One they hope will crush the German invaders once and for all. Through the winter of 1944, heavily outnumbered German forces defend the Panther Line against repeated Red Army attempts to break through and push north to the Baltic Sea. A sea of fire, constant shooting, constant explosions. You got to a position where you personally just hated the Russians and tried to kill as many as you can, because if you didn't do that, they would kill you. The coming spring thaw will make it hard for tanks to maneuver. The fighting dies down leaving battlefields along the Panther Line littered with the hulks of destroyed tanks. Today, in the forests of Estonia, historians still find stark reminders of those deadly months. This whole forest is sitting on the remains of a battle. This is a Russian infantry mine from the Second World War. During that time, there were so many battles here. That metal is pretty much everywhere. You're looking at the side armor of a T-34, the most famous type of Soviet tank from the Second World War. If you walk around here, you'll discover craters all over. The battles that raged on here were very cruel, and the losses were huge. But the Red Army will not be deterred. And in the spring of 1944, the Soviets gear up for a massive summer offensive. Key to its success are the weapons factories that produce hundreds of new tanks every day. The German uh, Reich had no chance to win the war because uh, in uh, modern wars, they are not won on the battlefield, but in the factories. The German Reich produced uh, in the Second World War only 25,000 main battle tanks, and the Allies uh, produced more than 200,000 battle tanks. By late spring, the Soviets have assembled over 1.2 million troops and 2,500 tanks, aiming to finally drive the stubborn Germans out of the Baltic states. And on June 22, 1944, the third anniversary of Germany's invasion of the Soviet Union, the offensive begins. In just a few weeks, four army groups advance through Estonia, Lithuania, and Latvia, squeezing the Germans back towards the Baltic Sea. 
On the southern flank, the Soviets push almost 200 kilometers towards the Gulf of Riga. The scale and intensity of the million-man onslaught overwhelms the Germans. They were attacked everywhere and from all sides. Wherever they went, they were beaten from all sides. They were attacked so badly, they were at a loss about what to do next. The Red Army were moving their units like a steamroller. After this battle, the Germans were turned around like a wheel. They're massively outnumbered and retreating all along the Baltic front. Hitler orders commanders to counterattack at once, and German tanks venture out on near suicide missions to surprise and, with luck, slow the Red Army juggernauts. In this whole army, there were panzer divisions, which normally had 120 to 140 tanks in 1941, which were starting a day with nine or 12 tanks. What was left over were like firefighters. They were sent from one crisis to the other crisis. The only chance uh, of uh, the superior German tank uh, units was uh, to create surprising situations. And Otto Karius is a master of surprise. When spotters report Soviet tanks in a village near the front line, he rounds up eight Tiger tanks and moves out. We are completely on our own. Somewhere in the valley was a village in which there were already Russian tanks. The village was called Malinava. It would be too dangerous for us to attack online. We have to get through this without losses, if at all possible. This tank battalion was the only one of the Army Group North with an affrontage of, at that time, about 800 kilometers. The only one against about 2,000 Soviet tanks. Karius comes up with a daring plan, one he hopes will flush any hidden tanks in Malinava into the open. Two tanks will drive into the village at high speed and surprise Ivan. He must not be allowed to fire a shot. I will lead and both of us will advance to the center of the village as quickly as possible. He could make an ambush and then uh, use the moment of surprise. That was the greatest advantage, the moment of surprise. Each of us knew at that point that only speed was decisive. Kersha noticed that the turrets of both Russian tanks were moving. He immediately stopped and knocked out both of them. He moves farther into the village and comes up against a chilling and fearsome sight. He radioed and pointed to the right. We were startled for a moment. We thought we had a king tiger in front of us that had been captured by the Russians. But it's not a king tiger. It's the Red Army's newest and biggest killing machine. A monster tank designed specifically to smash Karius and his tigers to smithereens. The Eastern Front, 1944. For seven months, German and Soviet forces have been battling for control of the Baltic states. 
In July, the Red Army continues its million-man offensive against the heavily outnumbered Germans. In southern Latvia, German tank ace Otto Karius leads an attack on Soviet tanks in the Latvian village of Malinava. He could make an ambush and then use the moment of surprise. That was the greatest advantage, the moment of surprise. But in the village, Karius and fellow tank ace Albert Kirscher get a surprise of their own when they come face to face with a monster tank. We thought for a moment that we had a King Tiger in front of us that had been captured by the Russians. What the Germans have encountered is the JS-2 heavy tank. Named for Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin, the JS-2 is the Red Army's answer to Germany's Tiger and Panther tanks. It's protected by 120 millimeters of frontal armor, and its 122 millimeter main cannon is powerful enough to destroy a Tiger. We were startled for a moment. After I initially hesitated, I fired and the tank burst into flames. At the edge of the village, the Germans surprise an entire unit of JS-2s in a rest area. Karius and Kirscher have only moments before the Soviet crews reach their tanks. But the outnumbered Germans quickly discover a critical flaw in the JS-2s. He had to bring the gun all the way down to make it level in order for the guy to put the cartridge in. And then he had to readjust it in order to shoot it. So there's, there was a, a time lapse in between. The slow loading Soviet tanks can't compete with the rapid firing Tigers. Only two Russian tanks tried to flee to the east. None of the others found any opportunity to move. It's all over in less than 15 minutes. Karius and Kirscher destroy more than 20 Soviet tanks in one of the most audacious armored engagements of the war. But the bigger picture remains unchanged. The Germans can't stop the Red Army's Baltic offensive. He was battered and we continued to hit and hit until death, everywhere. Through July of 1944, the German front line continues to crumble. The Red Army captures Vilnius and presses on to the frontier with East Prussia, part of the German fatherland. We could not afford to lose ground. We have to stop them because it's going to be worse if they take over Germany. As the Red Army nears the East Prussian border, Rudolf Salvermoser's unit is sent on a dangerous reconnaissance mission. We were the lead tank of that reconnaissance. We were supposed to find out where the Russians are and then defend that hill and see what damage we can do to them. We were behind a hill. It was more like a hill like this here. All you do is go enough that he can see out, you know, over the hill. And then he said, keep on going to the bush. And I tried to tell him, Sergeant, they, they'll see us. Then Salvermoser spots an enemy target. I saw the T-34. He was heading right into the woods. He was almost at the woods. I was shooting this way at 11 o'clock. And the sun, it was about 4, I guess, in the afternoon. The sun was shining. Your eyes are trained when you have these good optics. I shot. And as I shot, this flash came. I hollered, watch out. 
After seven months of bitter fighting, the Red Army has smashed through German positions. And by August is only days away from crossing the German frontier and invading the Fatherland. German commanders, urgently needing intelligence on Soviet troop movements, dispatch a unit of Stug assault guns to find and attack lead elements of the Soviet thrust. We were supposed to find out where the Russians are and then defend that hill and see what damage we can do to them. I saw the T-34, he was almost at the woods. I shot, and as I shot, this flash came. When I saw that flash, I saw the tank too, and uh, I hollered, pass off, watch out. It hit us. I came to when I was kneeling behind a tank, and I must have sensed that my arms hurt because they were all burned, and of course my face was burned. People say, that's impossible. I swear to that, that's what happened. I had sometimes nightmares about that later, you know, just thinking about it, what would have happened if they would have knocked me out? I would have been a goner. This is something I never forget in my life. All across the front lines, the Red Army pounds the depleted German forces. The Soviets constantly bring up reinforcements and grow stronger by the day, while the Germans get weaker. It is clear that they cannot hold out much longer. By late July, the Red Army has almost completely surrounded German Army Group North. Elements of the Soviet First Baltic Front drive towards the Gulf of Riga, tightening the noose. I fought the rest of the war in the Baltics, and I participated in a very interesting raid. Our goal was to advance with a lot more strength. They gave us a division of Katyushas, a heavy tank regiment and other things. With that, we would break through the front lines and advance to the Gulf of Riga. The end result was that we trapped the Germans in the northern Riga in Tallinn and Estonia. July 30th, 1944. The Red Army reaches the Gulf of Riga, encircling 30 German divisions and ending Hitler's last lingering hope for a turnaround in the fighting on the Eastern Front. Among us friends, we said, it doesn't look too good. The Germans are rapidly running out of ammunition, fuel, and food. It looks like another Stalingrad. But this time, a half a million are trapped. And everybody said, well, maybe they are going to pull us out. Maybe somebody is going to come and save us. The Germans again call on General Hyacinth Strachwitz. He is given a near impossible task punch his way through Red Army lines and create an escape route. With only 10 tanks and a few days to do it, the fate of 500,000 men lies in his hands. Everybody was pretty well aware that that was a dead man's job. Yeah. 
August 1944. The once mighty German army fights a desperate battle to prevent its annihilation in the Baltics. You got to a position where you personally just hated the Russians and tried to kill as many as you can, because if you didn't do that, they would kill you. Hitler's army group north is surrounded by Soviet fighters who are intent on their complete and utter destruction. They attacked us. They murdered our people. I was only in one mood, to kill as many Germans as possible. Thirty German divisions, a half million troops, face another Stalingrad, with only two options, surrender or die. Unless they can somehow find a way to escape. That perilous task falls to tank general Hyacinth Strachwitz, who looks for an escape route near the Gulf of Riga, where intelligence suggests Soviet defenses are weakest. On August 21st, Strachwitz leads a scouting force of just 10 Tiger tanks. Slipping through Red Army lines, he approaches the Latvian town of Tukums, not far from the Gulf. Tukums bristles with Soviet armor. T-34 tanks, at least 50 of them, are lined up in the center of town. If Strachwitz can get rid of them, an escape route will be open. Strachwitz was a bold daredevil, and um, the German officers were allowed to, to change uh, the mission if the situation changed. They had nearly no infantry, uh, they had no artillery, and so uh, the Navy <laughs> had to play the role of uh, artillery. Strachwitz in his staff had a radio communication um, with the Navy, and so they could make a good correlation, uh, fire and maneuver. Hoping to neutralize the Soviet armor before their crews can react to his attack, Strachwitz feeds their coordinates to a German naval flotilla in the nearby Gulf of Riga. It was the very first time uh, that a unit was supported by the fire of the Navy. The naval guns fire from 30 kilometers away, each shell taking over a minute to hit. The bombardment is lethal and intense. When it ends, Strachwitz and his Tigers charge into Tukums and finish off the few enemy tanks that try to escape. When the smoke clears, every T-34 is destroyed. Strachwitz's daring raid punches a hole in Soviet lines, opening an escape route for the battered soldiers of Army Group North. If you ask me today, how did you do it, I don't know. You didn't mutiny and you didn't chicken out. You are in it for the bitter end. 500,000 men break out of the Soviet encirclement and retreat west through the Strachwitz corridor. 
and Hitler is spared another Stalingrad. But the massive withdrawal marks the beginning of the end for the Third Reich. The Red Army pursues the Germans all the way to Berlin, and in May of 1945, the city is captured. Survivors of the fierce Baltic fighting look back on it now and ask what was achieved by the appalling death and destruction. We were thinking we are fighting for our fatherland. We really believed it. We were so brainwashed that we always believed in the end seek, the final victory. And when you look back, it seems silly, but uh, when you believe, you fight for it. I remember my friends who have passed away. I always remember them. May they rest in peace. We wanted to win it. That's all. To get rid of that insane Hitler saga. The cost of the Baltics' campaign on both sides is enormous, with each side losing hundreds of thousands of men. Across the three Baltic states, civilians died by the thousands, their homes destroyed, and their properties blighted by the wreckage of war. Remnants of these bloody encounters still litter the Estonian countryside. In 2000, historians pulled a massive wartime relic from a small lake near Narva on the Russian frontier. An entire Soviet T-34 tank, one of just a handful, ever recovered in such good condition. This tank was very unique, since it had German crosses on it. At some point, the tank was captured by Germans. When the Germans started moving back, they just sank this tank. This history is a real history that we want to preserve. Make a museum and make sure that all these things are displayed there. In 1944, the battles were horrendous. A lot of people died. Pretty much everyone around here lost someone. 